Good day, everyone. My name is Drew Voitel, and I am the Senior Project Associate for Education and Outreach at CAQH Core. And it is my pleasure to welcome you today to our webinar on the Phase 4 CAQH Core Operating Rules. Today, we will also have a special guest presenter with us from Eligible, a clearinghouse just now starting work on implementing and pursuing certification of the Phase 4 CAQH Core Operating Rules. Before we begin, I would like to mention a few logistical items. You can download a copy of today's presentation from the CAQH.org website. Navigate to the core pull-down menu at the top of the CAQH.org welcome screen and select the core education events page. A link to the PDF version of the presentation can be found under the listing for today's webinar. Also, a copy of the slides, as well as the webinar recording, will be emailed to all attendees and registrants in the next one to two business days. We will save time at the end of today's program to respond to audience questions. You are encouraged to submit your questions at any time during the webinar by typing them into the questions panel on your dashboard. We do ask that when you submit a question to please identify yourself and the type of organization you are with so that we can give you a more applicable response. So our session today will start with a testimonial from Phase 4 Implementer, Eligible, where they will provide a quick company profile, their certification of Phases 1 through 3, and the work they are starting on Phase 4. We will then see Phase 4 infrastructure requirements and the implementation value, followed by the implementation resources and certification for Phase 4. And of course, we will end the program with uh, audience Q&A. And so to start us off today, please let me welcome Kelly Gleason, who is a payer growth manager at Eligible. In her role, she actively works to maintain and add direct payer connections to Eligible's network. Kelly, go ahead when you're ready. Awesome. Thank you so much, Drew. I'm thrilled to be here to present to you guys today. So to start you off, I figured I'd tell you just a little bit about what Eligible is. Eligible is an electronic API platform that allows healthcare companies to pass and receive financial transactions. We process millions of transactions daily, about 14 to 18 million per month, and connect to about 2,000 payers. Our API can easily be integrated into your system with just a day's time. At Eligible, we take security and um, standards of compliance in high regard. We are SOC two uh, compliant, high trust certifi certified, and CAC core certified. Next, please. So we might be asking why we chose to certify with core for phases one through three. So basically, we just understand the value of a standard operating rules and how that's going to benefit our users and our company. The core is highly regarded as a gold standard, and by using these certifications, we are telling the world that we excel within these standards. The operating rules help to establish a predictable and standard request and response, which allows our company and users to quickly and efficiently distribute the appropriate information. Next. So you might be asking yourself, what kind of benefit will this have on our customers? By following the core standard operating rules, we make sure that all transactions submitted to the payer are done right the very first time. This makes everything easier and quicker on our customer. The rules help to provide transparency to our users. They know right away that we are following these rules and that we are always communicating with the payers in the most efficient and effective manner. Due to this standardization, we can quickly submit real-time 270-271 eligibility transactions to payers and provide our users incredible, valuable insight, which can then be used to properly build our bill their patients. We've seen a lot of cases within our own customers where just using these standard operating rules have really increased their revenue. Two great examples of this are Radnet and Zwanger, which are companies that have multiple locations nationwide. They have both seen increases in revenue that are astronomical, and we are very proud of that. So you could be asking yourself, what's next? Well, of course, phase four certification. We're beginning the process to get this started on our end, which started, starts with establishing a team. Just like with the other phases, I'll be leading the team to get us started. We'll also always have our technical support to help us through the process. We hope to begin to be certified within the next couple of months and be finished before the end of 2017. As we're already submitting 837s and 278 transactions, it's really important to us that we are always up to date with our certifications. Eligible strives to add new transactions all the time, and as we continue to add these transactions, we will always be looking to CORE to certify for the rest of them. Next. 
I think that's all I got, Drew. It's back to you. Great. Thank you so much, Kelly. It's great to see how the operating rules and certification together are helping a company like Eligible. Really appreciate the, the content you provided. And for the rest of us, this brings us to our first polling question of the webinar, and we'll have four of them today. And this question asks, please indicate whether your organization intends to voluntarily implement the Phase 4 CAQH core operating rules. And what will happen is I will launch this poll, and you will see it appear right on your screen. And we'll pause for just a couple seconds for everyone to uh, respond. And this helps us take a pulse of the audience and seeing where everybody is uh, on this question. And after a couple seconds, I'll share the results, and then we will move into our next section. We'll give it about five more seconds. All right, I will close the poll and share the results. We have about 70% voting, and I see we have about 149 people on the call. So let's take a look. 49% indicating they need to learn more. And it's great that you are on this call, and we're hoping that we can answer some questions. 29% saying not at this time, and then 23% saying yes. So I hope you find the uh, content on this uh, webinar uh, informing. And so next, to walk us through the Phase 4 uh, CAQH Core Operating Rule Infrastructure Requirements and Implementation Value is CAQH Core Associate Director Robert Bowman. Bob, go ahead. Great. Thank you, Drew. And just as Drew mentioned, uh, we do want to walk through some of those specific requirements on infrastructure. But first, let's get a little bit of lay of the land. Um, the phase four operating rule set includes requirements for four different transactions, the 278, the prior authorization, the claim transaction, and actually all three flavors. So you get the 837 institutional, professional, and dental claim, all requirements for all three types of claim uh, formats. We also have requirements for the enrollment disenrollment, the 834 transaction, as well as the 820 transaction, the premium payment. So these four transactions are all part of the phase four rule set. And we have built specific requirements all around the infrastructure. And we will walk through some of the details around the infrastructure in just a moment, but I want to kind of level set just, to, just for a moment. Um, we do have requirements for the processing mode. Either you have to process the transaction in real time or batch. Uh, so there are requirements around both batch and real-time requirements. Um, we also have requirements around acknowledgments, the safe harbor connectivity and security, as well as system availability and the companion guide template. Um, there are also some specific unique requirements for some of the transactions as well, and we'll go over those as, also in this afternoon's webinar. So with that, let's jump into some of the detailed requirements for the infrastructure on the next slide. And you can see here um, on this particular slide, we're talking about the processing mode, the batch requirements for processing mode. And across the screen, you can see that the requirements are specific for the 837, the 834, and the 820. And only for the prior authorization or the 278, if the entity offers the batch transaction. You may only offer this transaction in real time, so the batch requirements wouldn't be applicable. So this particular requirement is that if a batch of transactions, let's say a provider submits a batch of claims by 9 p.m. Eastern time on a business day, the response for that batch must be made available um, by 7 a.m. the next business day. Or each of the transactions has its only specific number of days that are required for that batch of responses or acknowledgments to be made available. Um, so you can see that through this um, requirement of including the acknowledgement for a batch of transactions to be returned back to the submitter. This allows for reduction in time for processing, reduces the cost of the transaction, includes better communication and coordination between trading partners, improves the interoperability of the transaction as it's conducted from the provider through a clearinghouse to the health plan and back to that provider, includes um, increases the efficiency of the process and also it can actually increase patient satisfaction because the claims can be processed more timely as well as the referrals and authorizations. So you can see that by implementing the phase four operating rule requirements for batch for these transactions, there is a large value for the industry. Since we have batch requirements for the how the transaction is conducted, we also have batch requirements on the next slide, as you can see, for the acknowledgement as well. 
the acknowledgement requirement for each of the four transactions is that the receiver of the transaction must acknowledge that with a 999 transaction to ensure that the sender knows that the transaction was received and was received well, that it was actually acknowledged and going to be accepted for processing. There is the additional requirement for the 837, and this is for all three types, again, the professional, institutional, and dental, for the 277CA, or claim acknowledgement, to also be conducted. So this is, a, again, a, a more stringent requirement for the claim transaction than for any of the other transactions that we may actually have a rule for in phase one, two, and three, and now four, the 999 is required for acknowledgement for any of the HIPAA standard transactions. Again, you can see that by ensuring that the industry uses the acknowledgement that, again, increases the value and the I'm sorry, increases the value of, the, of that transaction, increases the insurances that the roles and responsibilities between trading partners are assured. Move on to the next slide. Um, since we have requirements for batch, we also have requirements for real time. So if you conduct the transactions in real time, then these particular requirements would be applicable. Now we don't have, a, uh, perhaps throughout the industry, there's not a lot of uh, real time transactions that are being conducted for these four transaction types between the claim, the 834, the 820, for example. However, a good example might be that a provider may send in a batch of claims to their clearinghouse. That clearinghouse parses that batch of claims and submits each individual claim to its connected trading partner, that health plan, in real time. So there's kind of this real time in the middle between the clearinghouse and the health plan. So that health plan would be responding back to the clearinghouse in real time within 20 seconds back to that clearinghouse with the particular acknowledgement. Again, a 999 or the 824 transaction. As you can see, by processing these transactions in real time, again, the entire um, value uh, proposition for all the trading partners we realize. Again, reducing time and cost, better communication coordination, improved efficiencies, and inter interoperability. Since we also have requirements for processing mode in real time, on the next slide you can see we extend those requirements also to the acknowledgement. Again, when you conduct these transactions in real time, you also have to acknowledge those transactions with the 999 and the 277 CA as applicable um, for each of the transactions. Again, extending that value proposition for the conduct of the transactions through the entire um, uh, interface of that transactions. Again, from the provider to the uh, payer back out to the provider. Moving on to the next slide, you can see that we have ex also have very specific requirements for system availability. Um, and this is for all four of the transactions. This ensures that the system is up and available to receive the transactions in real time or batch at least 86% of the time per week. Um, provide a one week advance notice if there's any non-routine downtime. Um, provide a one hour uh, notice or explanation for any emergency downtime. Let's say you have to take your system or application down for a bug or a fix. It allows for the providers and the users of that system, um, clearing houses and software vendors too, to know that the system is, is down, there's a problem, there's an issue, but it's going to be resolved. Um, and more importantly, it also allows for the, the requirement of any sort of regularly scheduled downtime. So perhaps you're down from Sunday midnight to 3 to, to make any fixes or, or any system enhancements or fix any bugs. Um, it ensures that your training partner community is well aware of that particular downtime. Again, by ensuring this better communication, um, it can reduce costs and reduce time if your clearing houses, if your software vendors, if your connections, um, all know exactly when and where the system is available and when it's available. Moving on to the next requirement for phase four. Again, again we structured the requirement specific around infrastructure. Um, this requirement allows for or requires that if you publish a companion guide, the companion guide must follow a specific format and flow. So it allows for really easy publication of these types of guides and materials for your trading partner community. It allows for um, them to more easily um, digest them and, and ensure that when they build systems and applications and APIs, that they are actually meeting those requirements. And it's going to be the same for, um, you know, as Eleanor mentioned, they're, they're connected to um, hundreds, if not thousands, of health plans uh, in those transactions to ease the flow from from when a provider hits submit to the time the health plan receives it, um, setting up that particular network of the transaction that it can flow across 
I mean, is, is very timely. Um, and you can, we're trying to reduce that uh, uplift and uptake to ensure that the connection uh, is, is can be established as quickly as possible. Um, the testing can be coordinated as quickly as possible and to ensure that the connection uh, is made as, as securely as possible. And the companion guide actually helps um, entities uh, communicate those types of requirements to each other. We've gone to the next slide. We have some extended um, requirements that are unique to some of the transactions. Again, for example, the healthcare claim uh, does have specific requirements around the 999 and the 277 CA. And those requirements are that if when you conduct them, the transaction must be acknowledged within one business day. Um, whereas the 820 and the 834 transaction or the benefit enrollment and maintenance or the premium payment transaction, those have to be acknowledged within five business days. Again, see there's a variance between when the acknowledgement must be made available for the transaction. Um, one day for your claims, five days for the 820 and the 834 transaction. Um, so just some examples of some of those unique requirements by the transaction. And with that, I'll hand the call back over to Drew for our next polling question. Great. Thank you so much, Bob. That was great information. And that brings us to our second polling question of the webinar. And just like the first one, I'll read the question and then launch the poll for everyone to respond. And this question asks, is your organization planning on implementing the operating rules for the phase four transactions? If so, which ones? And I will get that launched right now. And we'll pause for just a brief moment for everyone to respond. And after a brief couple of seconds here, I'll share the results with everybody. I see our attendee number has ticked up to 164, and that's good to see. We'll take a couple more seconds. And the reason we're asking this question is this will help us understand uh, which, which resources might be in higher demand from our audience. It helps us planning uh, education sessions. Take a couple more seconds, and then I'll share the results with everybody. All right, we will close the poll and I will share these results. All right, we're seeing 75% indicating uh, healthcare claims and this is a check all that apply question. So this one got the most popularity followed by uh, prior authorization, 48%. Enrollment and disenrollment in the health plan, 40%, and then employee premium, premium payment at 18%. Um, Bob, what do you what do you think when you see these results? Does this jive with what you had in mind? Yeah, definitely. I think that um, many of the uh, attendees between health plans, clearinghouses, and, and software vendors, um, many of them probably have healthcare claim products, and so those products um, are, are most ripe for certification for phase four. Um, many of those uh, same entities may or may not have a prior authorization product or a service available, so we definitely would expect a, a little bit of a decline there. Right. Um, and probably the the uh, the least common transactions that are conducted um, are the premium payment and the enrollment disenrollment transaction. Sure. It's heartening to see that 40% um, of the respondents are when you are considering uh, certification for premium payment. Though I'm sorry for uh, enrollment disenrollment transactions. So we are seeing those those numbers across the industry increase as more and more uh, brokers, and more and more. Um, entities that facilitate those types of relationships between employers and health plans uh, right. adopt the transaction. So it, it's all good news. Yeah, good to see. And thank you, uh, thank you for that. And Bob, I guess I'll pass it on back to you. Great, thanks, Drew. And we do want to follow up. Um, we walked through some of the infrastructure requirements that are specific to all the transactions um, or individually for um, for processing mode and acknowledgments and containing guide template. Now we want to move into some of the requirements for the connectivity rule, which is an expansion uh, upon and builds upon what we, uh, the requirements for phase two. So there were specific technical improvements for the phase four connectivity rule. Again, it in includes, um, we looked at the implementers that implemented phases one and two and saw and, and really heard what they were trying to say about the successes of that, some of the lessons learned and the challenges of implementing phase two and made sure that we, in, in, included that feedback in phase four. Um, it does increase network transport security. So security is, a, is always a hot topic in healthcare and will probably always be. So we ensure that the phase four included 
additional security requirements. Um, it does separate the payload and processing mode documentation into two separate documents. So again, another improvement so that it may, makes it much easier to maintain and, and issue of revisions to the, the payload type tables that are available for phase four. Um, we do simplify the interoperability. We do converge into a single message envelope. More to come on that in just a minute. And also a single authentication standard as well. So making it much more simpler with only one of each to implement um, for the claim and for the prioritization, as well as premium payment and the enrollment discernment transaction. Um, there are also some additional information around the message interaction and some error handling that we'll walk through as well. Um, so again, we. As always, in all previous phases, we have a safe harbor for the connectivity. Um, it does allow entities to implement phase one, two, and four trend, uh, connectivity rules for all of the transactions. So you don't have to have this stopgap measure between one or the other. Um, you can implement phase four for your eligibility verification for the 270-271 transaction. It allows for that as well. So um, it, it's great that the requirements um, allow for that type of transaction support. Um, moving on to the next slide, getting into some of the detail for the connectivity requirements. Again, it is a safe harbor, um, so it allows for health plans to offer this for their provider and trading partner community. Um, all HIPAA-covered entities must support the core connectivity rule requirements for real-time and batch processing mode uh, for the previous phases for phase two. Uh, they can offer other communication methods and security as well. So Safe Harbor, this is the minimum requirements. If you have um, you know, proprietary connections today, you don't have to um, unplug those and reconnect with the new method. You just have to offer, a, if a trading partner knocks on the door and asks to submit uh, claims or prior authorization, for example, using phase four connectivity, you're up and ready to go and can implement that, that solution for your trading partner community. That's what the Safe Harbor will really be. Um, so it doesn't require you or, or to de-implement or unplug anything that you already have in, in, in place. Moving on to the next slide. Uh, again, continuing the connectivity requirements. You see here kind of a complex table, but hopefully just focus on the bright yellow um, to your right. This is where the changes are specifically for phase four. And just as a quick highlight, um, it does require the support of SSL 3.0, digital certificates, SOAP, uh, in WSDL with MTOM. Uh, the metadata defined very specifically with SHA-1 for checksum and FIPS-142 compliant can also be implemented. As batch and real-time processing modes are defined for each of the transactions, not just one or the other, but both are, so we include them. Not that you have to implement both, but it, we do include those requirements for, for clarity purposes. And we also uh, allow for the push and pull for generic messages for the A. 20 and 834 transaction. We'll talk about that in just a moment too. Um, we've also expanded the error codes uh, and updated those as well. Um, so that would be kind of our little level set. We'll kind of go into a little bit of the detail for each one of these topics um, on the next couple of slides. So if we move to the next slide, um, for these specific security requirements, um, the requirements are really based between a client and a server. So the emitter authentication requirements include the X509 digital certificate over SSL or PLS. Um, the username and password authentication has been phased out in phase four. So um, that particular requirement is only in phase two, not in phase four. So digital, digital certificate is, is the way to go, and the industry has really adopted that um, pretty much uh, universally at this point, um, with still those proprietary connections and phase two connections with username and password. But digital certificate has been where we've seen, I think, a majority of folks have actually tested and certified using digital certificate. Um, the transport security is the SSL version three or TLS 1.1 or higher. Um, SHA-2 for the payload integrity using the checksum as well in lieu of SHA-1. So we include and ensure that the, the transport security requirements are, are detailed within the rule as well. Um, moving on to the next slide. Uh, and the next topic, um, some, a little bit of detail on the digital certificates. Again, moving to a single submitter authentication method with removing username and password. Um, the digital certificate um, is much stronger than username and password. It reduces the implementation cost and complexity by having just one standard instead of two. The client certificate-based authentication does require the submitter to access um, a private key to use its public key certificate. Again, the digital certificates to expire need to be renewed. So again, it allows for a continuous improvement and to ensure that 
um, any sort of breaches or attacks can be kept at a minimum. Um, it also aligns with the clinical initiatives and the industry trends um, that use SOAP over HTTP for clinical data exchanges. So again, it, aligning um, both sides of that dynamic between uh, clinical and administrative transactions. Um, moving on to the next slide, you can see that um, there are specific requirements around the envelopes and the metadata. Again, the message envelope is really just the container. It's the UPS box for the transaction. So whatever that transaction may be, it could be a claim, it could be a prior off, it could be an eligibility transaction, it could be an attachment. All right, anything can fit in that UPS box, just as an example. Um, that could be used from the submitter to the receiver of the transaction. Um, so that envelope uh, ensures that the contents within it are, are completely intact. Um, it allows for basically um, metadata to be used, which is um, another analogy maybe would be, um, it's the uh, address to whom it's going and from where the package came, where it originated from. That me uh, metadata, the messaging that allows the sender and the receiver to communicate, allows the receiver to um, push that particular package, um, uh, sort it, and move it from place to place. Uh, within their own four walls. Um, moving that into what this means for the connectivity rules, again, that metadata really allows for um, a well-defined structure. The, the, the metadata is structured so that um, everyone knows what and where it is going. So it's, it's normative, so it helps you route the message anywhere you need to. And it also allows for um, Non-administrative message payloads, and by that we mean it doesn't necessarily have to be um, a HIPAA transaction within that envelope. It can be um, an attachment. It can be um, any other sort of uh, content that can fit inside that box or envelope. So hopefully that was clear. We, there, we do have very specific requirements around the envelopes and the metadata, and we ensure that the metadata is normative. Moving on to the next slide. Um, and the next topic, again, um, I mentioned that there is a uh, support for a generic push and pull for batch mode processing. Uh, because of the unique nature of the 834, the enrollment transaction, and the 820 transaction, the premium payment transaction, and how they may be conducted, um, and we see this sometimes, uh, particularly in, uh, in, in, Medi in the Medicaid world, uh, where they may have an MCO or they may have a managed uh, care contract, and they had need to send um, uh, patient rosters, or, or and they use the 834 for that particular uh, function, um, out to uh, that MCO. So they either can use the generic push to that entity, or the MCO might pull it from the client. Uh, so that the way that the, these two transactions can be conducted um, in the real world, we ensure that the rule can have very specific requirements on what that uh, transaction looks like um, to ensure that we really have a uniform implementation across the industry for those particular uh, ways that the, these two transactions are conducted. So again, it makes it simplifies the nature of how the industry and how the entities and trading partners conduct these two transactions. Again, making them very, very similar across the industry. Moving on to the next topic. Um, related to the connectivity rule. And this is the processing mode. And I did mention this a moment ago, that we do have requirements for both batch as well as real time. So we do have, and most of the industries probably have implemented these transactions in batch, um, but we, we do include real time mode transaction as well. Um, and exactly, we have all the spe uh, specifications within the connectivity rule for conducting the 820 in real time. You may never have implemented it yet, but it could be where the industry should go um, to move these EDI transactions into a real-time processing uh, process. Um, so all of the requirements for each of the four transactions include batch and real-time. Moving on to the next topic within the connectivity rule, and this is going to be specific around um, error handling enhancements. Um, as you can see, error handling can occur at various levels from the submitter into the receiver of the transaction. It could be at the HTTP level, it could be at the SOAP level, it could be at the core connectivity envelope level, or it could be at the payload processing layer. Each of those layers um, that uh, the, the 
the transaction is interrogated against has its specific errors that can go back to ensure that the submitter knows if an error occurred, what the error is, and then they can go through that, the business process or an automated process, hopefully, to, re, to fix the error and resubmit that particular transaction or batch of transactions. Um, so what we've done in phase four is that we've ensured that the error coding and handling um, was enhanced. So we added additional error codes based on implementer feedback from the phase two rule. And what those implementers said were, we need more error codes to ensure that we can have um, clear communication back with our trading partners. Um, we did remove error codes that uh, were required for HTTP mod because we don't, we no longer include that particular enveloping process um, for phase four. It's just HTTP uh, SOAP. Um, we also added examples and clarified the presentation of the error handling within the documentation, again, from the user feedback, uh, to make sure that it's very easy and can be more easily understood, I'm sorry, to ensure that um, both the uh, implementers, as they're remediating their existing system to support phase four, they understand exactly what these errors are, what the codes are, and, and, and to ensure to get them back to the submitter so that the submitter can understand them as well. So again, we enhance uh, the error handling requirements as well as what those error codes and what those error uh, messages are. We included uh, more, basically, um, except for removing the MIME ones. Um, with that, I know we've just shared a lot of technical information around the connectivity rule. I think we'll go ahead and hand this off back to Drew for another polling question. Yeah, Bob, that was a, a lot of information. Thank you uh, again for that second portion. And that brings us to our third of four uh, polling questions here, and I will read it and launch the poll again. This question asks, which of the following would you consider to be the biggest challenge to your organization's voluntary implementation of the Phase 4 CQH Core 470 connectivity rule? This is virgin, version 4.0.0, and I will uh, get it launched right now. And uh, pause for a few seconds. And this is a select only one. There might be more. You, you might want to pick more than one here, but I guess select the, the, the biggest one, <clears throat> your, your biggest challenge. And we'll just pause for a couple more seconds here. All right, a couple more seconds. And I have a hunch as to what the, uh, the most popular response might be, but we'll see here. All right, two more seconds and I'll close the results, or close the poll and share the results here. And here we go. And so 33% uh, saying having enough time and staff for implementation. Can't argue with that. And 30% saying fully understanding the requirements. And uh, so with that, I hope you uh, find this um, webinar helpful. 19% saying the organization's internal decision makers have not given the go-ahead. Certainly that can be a challenge if your, your leadership isn't um, uh, giving a go-ahead. 13% saying no major challenges, that's good to see, and then 4% saying not applicable. Um, Bob, if you have any thoughts, feel free to share or we can move on. Yeah, real quickly, um, definitely the, the resource constraints that entities have, um, especially now with very with so many different competing projects um, is, is definitely a consideration. We hope that um, Taha is going to share with you some of the resources that we have here. They hopefully will make it much easier as you consider um, remediating existing systems or building new systems from scratch and what that, those, those tools and resources are, are. We've had really positive feedback on how that really helps entities um, conduct their gap analysis, uh, remediate their systems, and then even through certification testing, um, those tools can really help reduce the burden that, that entities have. Great. Thank you for that, Bob. And so next, we'll discuss implementation resources and certification for the Phase 4 CAQH Core operating rules with CAQH Core Manager Taha Anjarwala. Go ahead, Taha. Thanks, Drew. Um, first, I'd like to thank uh, Kelly from Eligible, who spoke earlier about her Phase 4 implementation plans, and also thank Bob for walking us through the Phase 4 infrastructure requirements and providing us with an in-depth look at the value added these requirements bring to the transactions they support. So as Bob mentioned earlier, 
Um, as a next step, I'll be providing, providing you all with an inside look at the variety of resources and tools to help guide your organization through facil facil facilitation, implementation, adoption, and certification on the phase four operating rules. So we recognize that organizations face a variety of challenges when upgrading or implementing changes to their systems. Often these challenges include competing organ organizational priorities, such as trying to decide which IT projects to prioritize and determine which ones bring the most value add to your company or clients. Another challenge includes keeping up with, a, with the many deliverables associated with the project. To kind of help offset these challenges, uh, CAQH Core has created a number of resources and tools to help your organization identify priority areas, scope resources, manage deliver deliverables, and streamline project planning when implementing operating rule requirements for phase four, as well as for phases one, two, and three. All of our resources are available on our website for free. Um, and further, after a successful implementation of operating rules, CAQH Core offers an industry-recognized certification program to kind of help showcase that your organization's systems or products are operating in conformance with the operating rules. Next slide. So um, a very important resource that CQH Core offers is the analysis and planning guide. We offer these for every phase, phases one, two, three, and four, and there's a separate guide for each phase. Um, these guides have separate tools within it, so not only can you do a quick ass assessment where you can do simple checks of, of, or of yes and no, identifying if general operating rules apply to your organization, such as, you know, do we do real-time or batch? Um, further, the guide offers drill-down tools where you can check operating rule requirements line by line, determining whether or not they apply, its business impact, and its technical impact, and also helps you identify remediation strategies, such as making a software change, business process change, or even um, educate, education or communication um, opportunities within your um, own organizational departments or maybe with your trading partners. Um, this tool helps map touch points between systems and business processes to help streamline implement, implementation of the operating rules. So on this next slide, I'd like to highlight one of the tools within the analysis and planning guides that will help you with the coordination and planning of your operating rule implementation efforts. The stakeholder and business type evaluation tool helps your organization um, below will assist you in determining which operating rules apply to your organization and to generally consider which trading partners you may need to work with on planning and implementation efforts. Uh, for example, one critical question is to identify whether or not your organization relies on trading partners for transaction processing. And if you, if, if, and if you indicate yes, the tool helps provide you with direction on how to work and coordinate with business associates to ensure a smooth implementation of the operating rule requirements. On this next slide, um, the system inventory and impact assessment worksheet enables you to identify um, and inventory all impacted systems that process transactions touched by the operating rules. This worksheet will identify your systems impacted by the implementation of the operating rules, including in-house developed and maintained systems, off-the-shelf systems, or those fun uh, functions outsourced to a third-party vendor. Uh, while completing this analysis, you should also consider potential op options for addressing applicable operating rule requirements, such as remediating any in-house developed systems, replacing or upgrading an off-the-shelf system, or uh, or, co or contacting your trading partner to uh, revise your agreements. The key takeaway here is to understand how many of your systems or products are impacted and the operating rule requirements um, and understand which vendors you'll need to coordinate with. Uh, on this next slide, I'd like to highlight the gap analysis worksheet. Um, this worksheet is a detailed drill down tool that helps your organization determine and understand the level of system remediation necessary for adopting each of the operating rule requirements. The worksheet helps you identify gaps within your systems or business processes and helps you estimate the resources and efforts needed for remediation. Next slide. So on this slide, you can see we have a host of FAQs, um, over several hundred for each operating rule and operating rule requirement 
these are questions that we've received from organizations going through the implementation and certification process submitted through our email inbox and via phone. Um, as, you, as you can see, uh, we have uh, both common and themed and technical questions that come in, and with that, we would develop and turn these questions into FAQs. Uh, so these FAQs consist of real-world interpretation or assessment questions on the operating rules or certification process, which have been broken down into a question and answer format, where you can drill down onto a specific topic or subject area. We've even added a search function where you can type in a few key terms to help you find relevant FAQs related to your search. So next, I'd like to uh, provide you with an overview of the course certification program. As a program, voluntary course certification is really the industry gold standard on how a certification program should be developed and administered. The slide outlines the elements that make up the kinds of checks and balances that make voluntary certification program unique. We think that mo the most important element of the program is the actual requirements that are necessary for an entity to demonstrate conformance with the operating, operating rules. The actual certification test questions are developed by industry, for industry, and were developed by the in industry representatives. Those requirements um, include those test questions that were put through the same review and voting process that the operating rules went through. Um, that is that um, these the certification uh, core certification program was voted by by core participants and by entities that conduct the transactions. Um, so core certification really means the industry is deciding what's best for the industry in regards to certification testing. On the next slide, um, I'd like to provide you an overview of why core certification can be beneficial to your organization. Um, as you can see, um, we've highlighted many of the benefits uh, when making the case to pursue certification to, to your organization's leadership and as to why you know, it may be a good decision for your business. Further, this slide de demonstrates what type of benefits you should expect from your various vendors and clearinghouses. Further, many of the reasons why an entity um, gets core certified are based on the idea that there is an objective third-party testing and subsequently proving whether or not your organization is using operating rules as they are meant to be. That is, um, finding ways to efficient, efficiently, um, efficiencies and administrative uh, cost of healthcare. Um, for example, it's like going to H&R Block or a third-party accountant to help you with your taxes. You know, it's good practice to find someone outside of your organization to check your work to make sure you did the, did the right thing. And course certification is that kind of check for the operating rules and underlying standard transactions. So on this next slide, um, we've mat mapped out the best approach your organization can take when implementing and certifying on the operating rules. This approach starts with an assessment and reading of the operating rules themselves, followed by engagement of internal resources to start the project. Next, utilizing the analysis and planning guides I discussed earlier to kind of map out the gaps and identify remediation strategies by either working internally or with trading partners. After your systems have been remediated, the next step would be to pursue certification. That way your organization can showcase its efforts with operating rule implementation. The certification process includes a uh, submission of a pledge to kind of demonstrate your commitment to certification followed by certification testing to ensure you, uh, your systems conform with the operating rules, and lastly, application for the core seal. So on this slide, um, we've highlighted various points to consider to ensure your journey with implementing the operating rules is successful. Former, foremost, um, it's if you're already certified or implemented phases one through three, you can build upon your past operating rule implementation efforts and experience as phase four builds upon the requirements established by prior phases. Other items to keep in mind is to utilize all available tools and resource that it, resources that I've discussed earlier. Um, they are provided by CAQH Core and again are available for free. These resources will help to ensure you are set up for a successful implementation experience. Lastly, I will keep um, I would also like to mention that I, I would recommend to keep certification in mind as you go through the implementation process, as certification provides the opportunity to test and ensure your efforts to adopt operating rules um, and, con and those efforts um, conform with the actual requirements via certification testing. If you have any questions on either the implementation or certification process, feel free to contact us and we'd be glad to set up some time and talk. Um, so with that said, I'd like to hand the call over to Drew for our next polling question. 
Thank you, Taha. And our last polling question, I should say, our, our final polling question. And this uh, question asks, what phase four CAQH core operating rule topics would you like to learn more about in future uh, educational webinars? And this is a question that I look at the results of and my colleague Jessica Porras. Um, we, we covered a lot today, but if there's uh, other topics here uh, that you would like to hear from, uh, let us know. So I've just launched the poll. And we'll take just a couple seconds for, uh, for everyone in the audience, there's many people in the audience, to respond. And Jessica, I might have you comment on the results, since you're sitting right here. And you'll be helping with Q&A next. We'll give it a couple more seconds, and um, we'll see what the, the results say. All right, we're getting up to near 50%. I like to always try at least to get half. All right, we've got 50. We'll close the poll and uh, share the results here. And this one, again, was a check all that applies. So um, the, the big popular one here was implementation how-to. That's, um, that's very important, I'm sure. People are wondering how to get started. 34% uh, voluntary phase four certification, Taha. 25% uh, uh, implementer stories, and then 22% saying implementation benefits. So Jessica, what, what do you think we can do to help these people? Well, you know, um, I'm really happy to see these results, and we try to have implementers present, such as Kelly today, uh, with eligible, although she's just giving us kind of a glimmer of what they're going to be involved in in the next few months. We try to have these implementer stories that hopefully can help the rest of the audience and some of the lessons learned, but I think maybe we need to spend a little bit more time on that. That's good learning for us and for the work that Drew and I need to do the next few months. And then on, you know, voluntary phase four certification, Taha, I think we need to do a webinar just on that. And, you know, what's the status of four, phase four certification? Sure, that definitely. So, um, Currently, phase four set of certification testing is live. So, you know, if you're in the process of implementing or kind of want to check maybe some of your remediation efforts or even just want to start testing itself, you can actually um, go to our website and access um, the CAQ score third-party testing vendors web, uh, link to the phase four test site. So you can you can go ahead. It's up and up and live and ready. That's great. And you know, let's work on this for the next few months and yeah. do a webinar on this because I think yeah. our audience would find it useful. Yep. Absolutely. Thank you, guys. And now we are getting into our Q&A portion of the webinar. And Jessica, I have you slated to help, um, to help facilitate this. So if you're in the audience and you have a question, feel free to use the, um, the, the questions tool in your dashboard. And uh, take it away, Jessica. Thank you, Drew. Um, you know, before we get started with the Q&A, when we had that third polling question talking about what some of the challenges were, and I know that the big winner was, um, you know, time and resource constraints, I wanted to ask Kelly, you know, since she's here and she's an implementer, you know, do you have any thoughts on, on you know, what those challenges are and, and that would be helpful for the audience? Totally. So just for their benefit of knowing, we're a really small company. Um, I would still consider us a startup. You know, we are under 50 employees, but we knew that this certification was really important to us and really, really important to our users. It just let them know that we were taking this seriously. So the best advice that I can give is, is take the time to find the right people. Once we found the right people, all we needed was two of us, really. It was me kind of coordinating the whole thing. And then my technical contact who was able to go through all the testing. The instructions are so useful and so helpful. All the tools they provide. Um, everybody I spoke to spoke to throughout the process could not have been better. They were so able and willing to answer every question we had. So once you have just one or two people to do it, it really goes quicker than you think. And it's really not as time consuming or as demanding on your company as you would think it was. And that's coming from a very small company where every minute we spend is just incredibly valuable because we're doing the work of so many more people in such a small team. Thank you, Kelly. And you know, while I have you on the line, um, there is a question um, that came in for you. Um, so um, here's the question. Uh, awesome. with the, yeah, with the use of the APIs, which is what you guys are doing at Eligible, um, yeah. so what are the, you know, how does that make it 
uh, better? So is the implementation quicker than with a traditional method? How much quicker and cheaper is this approach? Awesome. So basically, our APIs are super user friendly and they're really simple. Uh, if you have your, your technical team work on them, they can be implemented within a day with just a few lines of code. So that's really, really great, meaning that if your tech team can implement it into a practice management system, we can have your providers go from not using EDI transactions to sending EDI transactions within the very same day. That's great. And all of our charges are basically based on a per transaction fee. We don't charge for any type of support or any kind of implementation fee or anything like that. So we try to keep costs low for our users and make it as easy and simple and quick as possible. Thank you so much, Kelly. Um, so let's see, we've got kind of a bunch of questions here at the last minute, so let me, let me see what we'll do next. Okay, here's a question for Taha. So Taha, the question is, if an organization does not support a transaction like the 820, does this affect the certification or is it a partial certification? Yep, so that's a great question. So um, certification is kind of specific for phase four um, related to kind of what transactions your organization conducts. So for example, if you are a clearinghouse or a vendor and only do um, claims and prior authorizations, um, you would only actually have to take te the test scripts and testing requirements for, for those particular transactions that, you, that your organization supports. Um, and we also, for phase four, will be issuing transaction-specific seals. So when you get do get course certified, um, you'll be able to kind of showcase what your product and um, ser or services or solutions, kind of what transaction specifically um, is certified. So if I'm hearing you, if you don't do with the transaction, you don't test for it. Yep. Well, thank you very much. Um, so I've got a couple questions that came in on the 999, Bob. So um, here are two questions on the 999. One is, are 999 responses already required for the 834, 820, 837 transactions? And another sort of related question is, is an, isn't a 999 redundant for a real-time transaction? And if it isn't, what is the additional value of requiring a 999? So I think there are just some general questions on the 999. And it, they're, they're actually really good questions because the, the acknowledgement transactions have not been mandated for use uh, by HHS or, or any other entity other than CAQH Core for our voluntary core certification programs. Um, so entities that have gone through certification, we have a complete list. As Taha mentioned, there we have over 310 or, or more entities that have completed certification. So we, we know that those entities are have implemented the, the acknowledgement requirements for phases one, two, three, and now phase four for each of the transactions, and, and that really is for, for, for batch transactions, the 999, and for the claim, the 277CA. Um, right, for many of the, um, the, the 27X transactions, if it's a real-time transaction, you, you wouldn't expect a 999 unless it's a reject, because um, you would expect the actual response, the 271, the 277 transaction for the claim status. Uh, response to come back in lieu of a 999, right? You send in a real-time request, you get the real-time response back. So in each of the requirements, um, I'm sorry, each of the transactions, do you have specific requirements around batch processing and real-time processing? And then how the, uh, um, how each of those acknowledgements uh, should go back and in what scenario and what situation, and also at what time. Uh, again, for real-time within 20 seconds, uh, for batch, it's generally 10 hours. If it's submitted before 9 p.m. Eastern, then the response should be available the next morning. Um, so again, the, the specifics can be found in the rule for each of the transactions and for each of the processing modes. Thank you, Bob. Um, our next question is uh, for Taha, and the question is, is a TPA that processes claims for self-funded groups considered a vendor or a health plan? Yep. So that's a great question. So um, actually, as part of the um, gap analysis tool that I kind of mentioned, you can kind of identify kind of your stakeholder type and classify where your organization falls within um, the four core stakeholder types. Typically, um, TPAs that have undergone certification have certified as a vendor, but a lot of the testing tasks and testing components that they've um, certified as were all kind of health plan facing since you're taking care of processing transactions on behalf of the health plan. So um, I would recommend 
as you're going through the certification process or as you're going through the um, implementation phase to kind of look at the gap analysis, identify kind of where you're where you where you believe your kind of TPA falls under, and then also look at the components kind of on the health plan side when going through implementation. Thank you, Taha. So I'm not sure uh, whether this is a question for Bob or for Taha, so I'm just going to ask it. Um, so the question is, if an organization supports the infrastructure and connectivity requirements, are there any non-marketing benefits for seeking formal certification for decision makers? So I think the, the question is, what are the benefits of certification beyond kind of marketing? And you touched upon a lot of them during your presentation, right? That this yep. is. Yep. So beyond marketing, um, you can definitely showcase yourself as an industry leader, um, especially with phase four. And then, and Bob had mentioned, you know, the phase four connectivity as a very robust and secure. So you can have the potential to kind of showcase that as well. And also, um, certification is just a good housekeeping component. Um, you know, for example, when you do your taxes, you use TurboTax or H and R Block just to kind of make sure that you um, the rule, the impl your implementation efforts and adoption efforts are actually conforming to the rules. So certification is a just good way of internally um, proving that you that you um, that you're compliant and conforming to the operating rules. Thank you so much, Taha. Uh, that that's really. Uh, a good thing for you to reinforce to yeah. this audience um, and you know our core director is here and there is one question that I am going to throw in her direction and you know what is the question is um, what is the status of the phase four operating rules when will they be mandated Sorry, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. Uh, I think as, uh, as a lot of you remember last year, the NCDHS, the National Committee on Vital and Health Statistics, which is the advisory committee to the secretary, uh, reviewed the phase four operating rules. And uh, despite the fact that we had overwhelming support from the core participants, almost an 85 to 88 percent approval rating, uh, there were some uh, segments of the industry who testified that they didn't think that the uh, the rules had any benefit. Well, obviously, everything we're talking about today kind of smashes that theory. <laughs> but uh, in any event, in terms of a government mandate, um, we have not heard any feedback yet from um, the Office of the National Standards Group and uh, the NCVHS in their recommendation to the secretary noted that they were strongly supportive of voluntary use of the phase four operating rules. So um, I think that uh, that message is getting out loud and clear to people. I think that, uh, again, industry pundits are seeing the value in these operating rules and uh, we're certainly going forward. Just as uh, core certification has always been voluntary, uh, we actually started out here at core with voluntary operating rules. So. Uh, we're just kind of re closing the loop and returning home to our, our, our roost, so to speak. But uh, uh, definitely, we're, we're taking it forward on a voluntary basis right now. Thank you, Denise. And uh, we are out of time. Um, so I would like to thank the audience for uh, listening. And um, hopefully, you found this information useful. I know it was a lot of information. And you know that you can always contact us via phone or email if you have any additional information. Um, I'd also like to point out some of our additional resources. These are also available online and are just a different way of presenting some of this information. It's very focused on certification right now, um, and it should be very useful for you. Um, and just to finish off here, these are some ways to engage with us. We do like, you know, having engagement with uh, our various stakeholders. So please, depending on what you're interested in, click on those links and contact us. And, and let me just say good afternoon. And um, take one moment once you close out of this webinar, please fill out the post-webinar survey. We really like hearing your feedback and, and knowing how we're doing. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you.